John 19, 16b to verse 30. Therefore they took Jesus away. Carrying his own cross, he went out to what is called Skull Place, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a sign lettered and put on the cross. The inscription was, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I'm the King of the Jews. Pilate replied, what I've written, I've written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took the tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but toss for it to see who gets it. They did this to fulfill the scripture that says, they divided my clothes among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. So they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on hyssop and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, we always regard in our world last words as crucial, uh, as critical. Uh, when you're watching a movie, even in some songs, poetry, uh, last words spoken by people just before they die receive a kind of mythic status, don't they? A kind of, they're the moment where souls are revealed. Moments of deep personal revelation. I guess they could be if they actually ever happened or if we remembered them. And even if they do, there's a lot of debate, isn't there, about what the person actually said, or whether we could actually hear them, or what they actually meant and what they were revealing. In fact, there can be so much debate about the last words that we actually forget what the last words were. But when it comes to Jesus... We actually have his last words written down, don't we? And we have in today's passage his last two words spoken before he died in public, recorded for us. And there's no debate. And these last words are very concise. Only two. They're sparse, they're revealing, and they're thought-provoking. Today, we're going to look at Jesus' last two words and see what he means. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, thanks for Jesus' last two words. Thank you that they're recorded for us. I uh, thank you for his biographers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Thank you for their different perspectives and the way in which they constructed their biographies so that we could know Jesus as he truly is. Help that to happen today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, just as I mentioned in my prayer, there are four biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Uh, all of them are written for certain purposes and perspectives, no different to any other biography or any other history. That's just the way we humans work. And all of them record some of the last words of Jesus. Uh, John, the biography we're looking at at the moment, is very clear about why he wrote. John 20, verse 31, these are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. John wants us to meet Jesus. Uh, come and see Jesus as he is. Know what he's like. Know his identity. Know that he's the Son of God. Know that he's the one God promised 
to fix the world. Know that he's the one that God said would rule the world rightly. But don't just know it. Believe it. Believe it. Believe this about Jesus. And so John writes to persuade us. Like a lot of history, John writes to persuade us so that we can actually trust the identity of Jesus. Uh, and if you listen carefully, he does that because John wants us to receive something. John wants us to receive life in the name of Jesus. Life as it was created to be. Uh, now, one of the problems with biographers is a, a lot of people read them and go, actually, that's not what that person actually thought about themselves. <laughs> that historian's just imposed a framework on them for their own purposes. But that's actually not what happens with Jesus. Uh, as you read the four biographies, you realise that the people writing have captured how Jesus really thought about himself, really understood who he was. For example, in John 4, 34, John 5, 36, Jesus describes his work. He's come to do a job. It's a job that God sent him to do, like a father sends a boy to go and do and finish some task. This father has sent his son to complete or finish or perfect what God himself has already planned. In John 17, which is Jesus' last prayer with his closest mates, Jesus states very clearly, John 17, 1 to 4, that he's come so that people can have life, just like John says, and that life is to know God. And Jesus says at that point as he prays, he's completed that work. I mean, no one could refill the Father better than the Son, could they? And others recognise this about Jesus. It's not just John, it's not just Jesus, it's others. And not just with names that start with J, though Jesus' cousin John recognises this about him. When his cousin first meets him out in public, John says to everyone standing around, look, see this bloke? He's going to fix up the world. He's going to take away the sin of the world. A sin, we know what sin is, don't we? <laughs> we hear about it every week as we gather, as we should. It's the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. And it's the thing that stops us knowing God. Oh, why would you bother knowing God if you're God? And so when you boil all of that down and you understand what John has written, what Jesus thinks about himself and what others think about Jesus, you realise Jesus has come with a very clear job. He's come to show who God is. So that we can meet God and have life. And to do that, he removes the thing that stops us. That thing called sin. Jesus has come so that we can know God and have life. And he'll do that by dealing with sin. It's really helpful to get that in mind because we're right at the tail end of the biography now, aren't we? We're dealing with the last moments of Jesus' life. And, and understand those last two words. You've got to at least have a grasp of what Jesus was on about. Well, let's turn to those last two words now. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, when you look at that passage, you'll notice I've divided it up into four scenes. Uh, John is a really skillful writer. Uh, he gives us four scenes here. Reaching a climax in the last one. And in that last scene, Jesus speaks his final two words. You'll see it there in verse 28 and verse 30. Uh, Greek is a lot more succinct at this point. English has a lot more words. Jesus only says two words. Uh, the first word there in verse 28 is translated, I'm thirsty. The last word is translated there in verse 30 as, it's finished. Jesus speaks two words, his last two words. I think as we come to that last scene, the three scenes before us prepare us. They give us all sorts of ways to look at what Jesus is saying. I look there at that first scene, verses 16 to 22. We see the view of Pilate. Pilate's the local Roman governor. And we see the view of the religious leaders of God's people. 
Pilate's view of what is happening and what Jesus says is captured in verses 19 to 20. Pilate also had a sign lettered and put on the cross. The inscription was Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. It's been a tough day for Pilate. It's been a tough day for Pilate. This wasn't what he was hoping for. Passover week in Jerusalem is always stressful. You get all the Jews in the city and they all want to get their own way. There's always a fear of a revolution or a rebellion. In fact, they trooped in stacks of extra troops every Passover week because they were scared of what would happen. And today has just been the worst day for Pilate. He's the ruler of the local Roman province. He's got all the authority, all the military firepower, all the cards in his hand. But on the other hand, he's just been played by the Jews. They've played him. They've manipulated him. And he's been humiliated in front of the mob that they've whipped up. If you're listening carefully to what Mary was reading, which was the section before this, Pilate has said consistently, there's no grounds for a death charge. Time and time again, Pilate has said that. There's no reason for us to put this bloke to death. And time and time again, Jesus' own nation has chanted crucify. And they've threatened Pilate. They've manipulated Pilate. They've attacked his authority. They've cast slurs on his Roman character. Backed into a corner, Pilate fights. It's been a horrible day, but he's going to get some propaganda out of this. And so he pivots and uses the moment as a blatant political power play. Here's your king. Here's your king. And as he says that to Jesus' own mob, who do they chant is their king? Our king is Caesar, the ruler of Rome. Pilate's won the game, hasn't he? He's the ultimate political backroom authority. And now he rubs their noses in it. He writes a title, which was stock standard. There was always the criminal charge on the cross. He writes a title. He makes sure that it's in all the languages of the day because everyone's trooping up and down this road to Jerusalem, aren't they? And you notice what he puts on that title? Pilate has just killed the king of the Jews. Pilate has just killed the king of the Jews. What I've written, I've written. Pilate's interpretation, he's won the power game, hasn't he? He's killed the king. His personal ambition is reassured. He's finished off his rivals and the Jews better pay attention. And many people like that today, aren't there? Many people treat Jesus like that today. He's finished. Is yesterday's news, if he ever started. Jesus has no power, but we do. We've got the power. The power to run our own lives, the power to ignore him, the power to use this moment for our own ambition, at least a holiday. At the very same moment, in the same scene, the religious leaders reveal their interpretation, don't they? How they have used these events. Look there in verse 20 and 21. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. To the religious leaders, well, Jesus is a pretender. Jesus is a pretender. Ever since John chapter 2, the second chapter of the biography that John writes, the religious leaders have been in conflict with Jesus. They've questioned his claims. They've questioned his authority. They've questioned his nature. They've questioned his parentage. They've plotted to destroy and remove him. And now they've manipulated Rome and Pilate, the political and criminal systems. They will stop at nothing to get rid of the pretender. Their opposition to Pilate's title on the cross reveals their understanding of these last moments. Jesus was just a pretender. And now they've finished him off. Many people today treat Jesus like that, don't they? He's just a pretender. 
some historical oddity that had claims above his station, someone you can remove so that he won't embarrass you or shock horror attempt to lead you, maybe even dare to exercise authority over you. You just got to get rid of the pretender. Now well, the second scene is there in verses 23 to 24. And there we see the view of the soldiers. These are the men who crucified Jesus. Uh, please recognise that John doesn't dwell on any of the physicality, does he? Doesn't talk about the blood. Doesn't talk about the thud of the hammer or the wincing or the cries. He doesn't deal with any of that. Uh, it's very simple. The crucifixion happens up there in verse 18. There they crucified him. That's it. You see, that's the way the Romans did things. They turned up and they did their job. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They took the tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but toss for it to see who gets it. That's what the soldiers did. Another day at the office for these men, isn't it? Turn up to work and look at the job sheet. Three crucifixions, we know what to do. Get all the wood ready, crucify the condemned, cast their lots, get their loot, go home. That's how it always was with the Roman soldiers. They were good at death. They did it very efficiently. They obeyed their bosses. Another day at the office, go home, what's for dinner, honey? Now, many people treat Jesus like that today. It's just another day at the office. What's today? It's Friday. Uh, public holiday. What will I do? Turn up to work, obey the boss. Well, the boss is really them. And then they just get on with it. The third scene is verses 25 to 27. And there we see the one that is the most emotional, at least from the perspective of Jesus' closest friends and family. As Jesus hangs on that cross, he sees his family and friends standing by the cross of Jesus where his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his home. The close community is there, family, followers, and that close community is now broken, isn't it? His friends and his family think that that community is finished. You could preach a whole sermon on how caring Jesus is at this point, couldn't you? I mean, at what presence of mind at the moment of death, speaking tenderly and caring for those in need? It's not hard to imagine their grief and their fear. That fear carries over. Just look at John 20, verse 19. Their complete despair, this close community, they've spent every day for three years together. Morning, noon and night, every meal time. What a community. And the community is now finished as Jesus is crucified. Many people today are like that with Jesus. Despair and sadness and grief because it just didn't measure up to what they hoped for. I think John has constructed this section brilliantly. Three scenes that confront our views of Jesus' final words, his significance. We're given a number of reactions. Do you view him as a king that's killed? Do you view him as a pretender who's finished? Do you view him as oh, just another job? Or do you regard it as a close community that never really lived up to what you hoped for? John sets the scene in those three scenes, and then he brings us, because of that, into the final scene. It's that final scene, verses 28 to 30, and Jesus' second last word, I'm at point three on the eight line, Jesus' second last word is recorded there in verse 28. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. What a strange word to record. I mean, what a glimpse into the soul of Jesus. He's thirsty. But it actually is. It's a remarkable glimpse. Because notice all the words around it. See that word accomplished? See that word fulfilled? 
See that word down in verse 30, finished? All the same Greek word. And when the same word's repeated three times in three verses, you probably should pay attention. Because it tells you why this is going on. Why did Jesus say, I'm thirsty? It's there in verse 28, isn't it? Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be accomplished, Jesus speaks. What presence of mind to think through the plan of God at the moment of death and go, I must stay focused on the work. I must stay focused on the work. Because I, I hope you heard in Psalm 69, verse 21, that, word, that verse in that poem that was written so many years before that Mary read, which talked about someone who was so abandoned yet desiring to trust in God, and they were thirsty, and they were given vinegar to drink. You see, at this moment, Jesus isn't losing it because he's thirsty. Jesus is saying he's thirsty because he's in complete control. Nothing accidental, not even his thirst. Nothing coincidental, nothing unintentional. And when you realise that that's what's going on with that second last word, you then look back at everything that's happened and go, actually, he's been in control the whole time, hasn't he? Right from his arrest in the garden through to his very careful words at his trial, to the way in which he talks about his betrayal and his conviction, right down to the type of actions of the soldiers at the foot of the cross. Did you notice that? The fact they even rolled dice shows that Jesus is in control and the care of his own mob. In, in every aspect, Jesus is acutely aware of the moment. And he knows that he's got a job to do set by his father. So the cry of thirst is not a cry of despair, is it? But it's a cry that I'm in control. I'm supreme. I am committed. And then he utters his last word in verse 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, finished. It is finished. And then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It's the third time that word has been used in three verses. Pay attention. In fact, it's the same word I referenced when I talked about John 4 and John 5 and John 17. It's right through all those passages as Jesus describes his work. He's come to complete and perfect the work God had set before him. And do you notice he doesn't say, I'm finished? Did you notice that? Do you notice he says, it is finished? Jesus has perfected the job he came to do. It's completely intentional. And so what does he do at that point? He gives up his spirit. He's even in control of giving up his spirit. Remember his work? We talked about it right there at the beginning. This is the work that's accomplished. The work was to reveal God so that people could know God and have life. The work was to remove that obstacle that stopped people knowing God, sin and its consequences. And to do that, Jesus was intentionally the substitute for every human being at the bottom of the cross. Every human being in this room, so that the judgment would go on him. Jesus has finished. And in finishing that, he's revealed completely. So just go back over those interpretations. Pilate said, I've killed the king. Actually, no, Jesus has just been crowned, hasn't he? That's the king you want. The king who is single-mindedly committed to a job so much that he will lay down his life for his enemies. That's a king with authority, isn't it? Not a king that's finished. The Jewish authorities thought he was a pretender. Instead, he's the perfect sacrifice. No pretense here. He didn't deserve to die, and yet he did. Nothing pretend about that. The soldiers, well, they've just done a job. No, Jesus has just done a job. The job. Perfecting the plan of God so that we can know God. And unlike those closest to him who regarded this as a disappointing moment, uh, this is the climax 
The job is perfected. Jesus isn't finished. The job is. And he creates a brand new community that will never be broken. Jesus is exactly who John wants us to know. He's the promised saviour of the world who rules in such a way that with authority he gives up his life so that sin is dealt with and we can meet God. It is finished. Well, they're memorable last words, aren't they? Only two. Memorable, sparse, concise. I'm thirsty, it is finished. They reveal perfectly who Jesus is. They reveal perfectly who Jesus is. So what are you going to do with these last words? We've only got to remember two. Only got to remember two. What, what, are, what are we going to do with them? Well, John's helpfully given us all the options. Really, the options boil down to two, don't they? Either you hear these last words and conclude with all those other scenes that Jesus really is finished. Or you hear these last words and believe that Jesus completed the job set before him and we can now have life. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your words. Thank you for these last two words. Thank you that they bring life by removing sin. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he was the committed king with all authority who used that authority to give up his spirit so that our sin could be forgiven. Thank you that he's not a killed king, a pretender, a box to tick, or failure. Thank you that he is the one who finished the job. In his name we pray. Amen.